welcome to using PowerUp SQL and Gadi for Active Directory information gathering. So that's kind of a mouthful of a title, but you know what you probably gathered from that you know title there is that this is going to be about Active Directory and information gathering. And what you may not know from that title is those two tools, PowerUp SQL and Gadi. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you know you guys are all familiar with um, Active Directory information gathering concepts and you know how to use these two tools to accomplish that end. So you know, just quickly about me, uh, my name is Thomas Elling, and I'm a web application and network pen tester at NetSpy. Um, I also worked with Scott Sutherland, uh, who is the creator of PowerUp SQL, on the Active Directory information gathering functionality uh, you know, in PowerUp SQL. Um, and I'm also the creator of Gaudi, which stands for Go Dump Domain Info. And I'm kind of going back and forth, Go DDI, Gaudi, or whatever. But you know, we're kind of settling on that for the moment. Um, you know, personal fact, um, I actually like the Venom movie. So maybe that says all you need to know about me. But um, yeah, I thought it was pretty good. Um, you can also find me on Twitter, and I blog at uh, blog.netspy.com. And I'll be throwing these slides up on SlideShare here right after this. So. Um, so again, this is kind of meant to be an introductory level talk. We're going to be talking about Active Directory concepts, AD information gathering, um, you know, and PowerUp SQL and Gaudi. So we'll go over install instructions, setup, methodology of those two tools. You know, how are they working under the hood, um, and demos for both. And um, you know, I also want to recognize some previous research that's been done in the area because um, you know. It's really great work you know, that I've learned from. Um, and at the very end here, I just wanted to talk about a few detection te techniques. Um, and really, those are just Windows event IDs that I found that have been pretty interesting for me while I'm developing these tools and while I'm testing in the lab. So, so before we get into that, why is AD information gathering useful? And I kind of like to think about it in three ways here. So you know, in terms of situ situational awareness, what am I looking for? You know, whether you're a pen tester, red teamer, blue teamer, you know, whoever you are, whatever, you're, however you're going about this, you need to know what you're looking for. Um, and, you know, an information gathering isn't necessarily a, it's it's not trivial, right? So you know, with these automation tools, you know, it's made things a lot easier, and it kind of gives you a better idea of what's in your environment, and really, you know, you can't target what you can't see. So, and then the next thing is just you know escalation paths. So you know, where are our privileged users logged in? Um, where are our highly trafficked servers? You know, information like that. And if you've ever used Bloodhound or Sharphound before, you, you know that being able to see these escalation paths you know, and see them visually is really impactful when you're doing you know, any kind of testing, really. And then also identifying silly misconfigurations. So, you know, stuff like checking to make sure users that shouldn't be a part of groups with administrative privileges, you know, aren't in those groups. And, you know, even things like seeing passwords in the description attributes when you're pulling back users. Um, I've only seen that once. And nine times out of 10, those passwords aren't going to work. But you know, on that 10th time when it does, you know, that can really make a difference. And even when those don't work, you know, that can give you an insight into, you know, what sysadmins are doing with their passwords and, you know, what kind of passwords are they using, so. And then why are we talking about these two tools here? So really they're just information gathering alternatives. So you may be familiar with PowerView, and you know, that's a tool written in PowerShell. Um, and really what separates these two tools from you know, something like PowerView is the mediums that they're doing this information gathering through. So obviously PowerUp SQL is in a SQL Server attack toolkit, so we're gonna be going through SQL Server and using ADSI to dump that information. And then for Gaudi, or Go DDI, that's written in pure Go, and it's just using LDAP to achieve that end there. And really, yeah, they're just non-typical ways to dump information. So just some, you know, I wanted to recognize some people in the community that I've learned from specifically and who have done great work in this area. Um, you know, Harmjoy over at SpectreOps, um, you know, he's put out a lot of great research, a lot of great tools, a lot of great blogs. And, you know, really up here, everybody on this slide here, you know, this phrase has probably been overused enough, but really we're standing on the shoulders of giants, you know, with this research and the tools that, you know, 
we're all looking at here. So um, just really a big thanks to these guys and all the work that they've done. Um, and if you've ever been to adsecurity.org, absolutely check it out. It's great reading, pretty much required homework if you're going to be getting into Active Directory security at all. Um, Nikhil, he runs a great blog as well. Um, and Noel Bind Scott Sutherland, he's done a lot of great work in you know, SQL Server research and you know, obviously the creator of PowerUp SQL. And then you know, all of the authors of PowerView too. And you know, we kind of touched on PowerView a little bit before, but you know, PowerView now is a part of the PowerSploit repo up on GitHub. And it's part of the recon module stuff. And it's dumping you know, AD information via you know, PowerShell AD module hooks, LDAP.NET, WI, you know, Win32, all that stuff. And really, it's just you know, uh, the Bloodhound ingester for PowerShell is actually based on PowerView. You know, I don't know where it's at exactly now, but really, that's, you know, it's a really important tool. And you know, I've certainly learned a lot from it. So, and like I said before, this is kind of we're going to go over some, in, you know, introductory, some basics here, um, just so you know everybody's on the same page. But you know, I apologize to all of you who already know this stuff. But you know, just a little bit of intro. So you know, what is Active Directory? So. Um, you know, even if you can't define it, chances are you've probably experienced or interacted with AD before in your life. You know, logging into your Windows domain join computer, you're using, you know, domain services and stuff. So it's Microsoft's directory service, and we already kind of knew that, right? But a directory service is essentially just, it's providing resource and network mappings for objects that are distributed across a network. And you know, this includes like a wide variety of directory services, federation services that uh, deal with you know, single sign-on, lightweight directory services, and domain services. And you know, domain services here are really just scalable infrastructure for object management. And that's really what we're going to be focusing on here. So you know, I see all these diagrams online with triangles and squares and you know, all these computers and stuff. But you know, I wanted to give you something a little bit different in terms of the logical you know, view of AD. So at the very top level, we have forests, right? And those are going to be collections of one or more tree structures. And then within trees, we have you know, one or more collections of goats or domains in this example. So these all kind of represent security boundaries within AD. And a domain here is just a collection of objects. And you know, we're separating those objects into you know, two main groups, right? We have resources, which is like your printers or something like that, and then your security principles, which is really just you know, your users and computers. And those users and computers are just basically just physical entities on your domain. You know, you're a user. Um, and then you know, domain controllers, we all kind of know what domain controllers are, but those are the servers where Active Directory is installed. And you know, that can be on one or more uh, DCs, and you know, all that information is replicated across those DCs. And then we kind of have um, OUs and groups. And an OU is an organizational unit, and that's a container for users, computers, groups, and you can apply group policy and delegation to an OU, whereas you know, in contrast with groups, those are collections of users and computers where you know, fine-grained access control can be applied, but you can't apply those group policies. There are that delegation in the same way that you can with those organizational units. OK, so we kind of have that high level out of the way, right? So how are we accessing domain services? So for Power of SQL, what we're using is ADSI, the Active Directory Service Interfaces. Essentially, this is just a set of COM interfaces you know, that are used to manage network resources. And we're using the OLEDB provider for ADSI in, you know, PowerUp SQL. And essentially, you know, ADSI has LDAP providers. And if, you know, you're confused about what ADSI is, you've never really heard of it, you don't really understand that concept, it's really, think of it as like, you know, again, this is a broad generalization, but it's a wrapper for LDAP, essentially. You're using LDAP, you know, at the very end there for PowerUp SQL, at least. And then, you know, speaking of LDAP, that's essentially the lightweight directory access protocol. And that's what Active Directory is using to get that information. So it's used to send and retrieve domain information. Um, and it supports different authentication methods. So we're talking about, you know, simple bind, Sazzle with Kerberos, and stuff like that. 
So, you know, LDAP basics again here. Sorry, I don't know if I'm boring you guys, but just, I don't know, this is kind of important topics, you know, to kind of get in and understand AD and the information gathering. But I promise there's going to be some demos later on here, so don't worry. It's not just going to be walls of text. But so LDAP, um, we have entries, which are collections of attributes. And those, you know, entries are identified by, you know, unique identifiers or DNs, distinguished names. Um, and there's an example of that right there. And then with your attributes there, that's essentially the LDAP data that's, you know, identified by a predefined name. And that's kind of the information that we're going to be looking for. That's, that's the meat and potatoes right there. And then scope specifies the search object that we're using within when we're making those LDAP queries. An example, that's, you know, a whole subtree or something like that. And then filters here are interesting because that's how you filter down data, obviously, and that's how you're selecting data within a search. So, for example, in here, we're searching for groups, and we're using, you know, the object category filter there and SAM account name with a wildcard, which means we're just returning all the groups, um, you know, from AD there. And notice that we also have, you know, you can combine multiple filters, and we also have an AND operator there at the very end. And those operators can be, and, you know, AND equal to or not, and, you know, et cetera. And here's just, a, you know, a list of useful LDAP filters. Um, and, you know, you can take a look at these, reference them later in the slides. But the one thing I wanted to note on was for the DCs there, um, you're going to notice after user account control, there's an odd string of digits. And essentially what that is, is it's an object identifier. And in this specific case, that's an LDAP matching rule and. So what that means when you're trying to identify an, a DC, a match here is only going to be found if all of those bits from the attribute match the value. So it's kind of, you know, a, basically equivalent to a bitwise and operator. But, you know, just those are some examples of some useful filters there. So got all the basics out of the way. Let's get into the tools, right? So first tool is PowerUp SQL. And essentially, this is just a PowerShell-based toolkit for attacking SQL Server. So, you know, it supports SQL Server discovery, weak configuration auditing, privilege escalation, post-exploitation. And, you know, some, you know, Scott Sutherland released this for uh, Black Hat Arsenal for 2018, but um, he actually created a PowerShell script for uh, a SQL C2 server. So he was pushing that up into Azure and, you know, kind of demonstrating some of the value there as an alternative C2 channel. So that's, you know, kind of one of the interesting things that's been coming out of PowerUp SQL and, you know, in terms of the post-exploitation, privilege escalation, really just, you know, some of the interesting functionality that PowerUp SQL supports. And at the end of the day, really, PowerUp SQL is just about hacking SQL Server on scale. And that on scale part is extremely important. You know, running this in an enterprise environment, um, it's been pretty quick for what it is in PowerShell. So, you know, as opposed to configuring and looking at all of these configurations on your SQL Server uh, manually, it really speeds things up. So, you know, why are we talking about SQL Server and why are we still talking about PowerShell? Um, you know, SQL Server is going to be extremely popular in enterprise environments. And, you know, where you have AD, you're going to have SQL Server because it integrates so well with Windows services, and that's by design. So, you know, it also offers a ton of vertical escalation opportunities on the domain. Um, and a lot of times, you know, people aren't looking at the SQL Server or the database layer, you know, for escalation paths. So you're kind of flying under the radar when you're attacking through SQL Server. And, you know, there's been a ton of instances where I've seen and used SQL, you know, power up SQL. Um, and, you know, I can go from, you know, sysadmin to DA just through a few hops, through a few links. So it's really just a wealth of, uh, you know, of escalation opportunities. And then why PowerShell? You know, obviously, native to Windows, runs commands in memory, and is still flagged as trusted. Um, but, you know, in the future here, as we're moving along, you know, PowerShell v5 logging, EDR solutions, and stuff like that, we may need to start obfuscating or disabling security features to continue to use these PowerShell-based tools. So, you know, looking into the future, PowerShell is absolutely still relevant, but we may need to start, you know, we need some wriggle, wiggle room to work with it. So. So 
getting started with Power Up SQL, you know, first place to look is the wiki up on GitHub. So you're going to find setup instructions, you're going to find cheat sheets, documentation, resource links, and really I would recommend taking a look at those cheat sheets up there because that will take you from, you know, just discovering SQL ser servers to, you know, all the way to escalating on the domain. So those cheat sheets have been invaluable to me, um, you know, even though I still use the tool pretty regularly. So setting up Power Up SQL, you can you know download the file, you know drop it to disk, import the module that way, or just install the module. Or you can use the two download cradles here, um, which you know you may be familiar with before, but yeah, they're right there for if you want to reference them later. And then once you get everything installed there and that module is imported, you can see all of the commands just by running the get command module. And then, you know, if you want to see the AD information gathering uh, command up here, what you can do is just throw on that uh, dash name uh, command line option and get dash SQL domain star. So all of these functions are designed to start with, you know, get dash SQL domain, so you can find them that way. And if you want to get help, you know, just run the get help command. And really, that's all the further we're going to go with introductory stuff with you know, Power Up SQL. If you're interested in seeing more of its functionality, check out the Black Hat Arsenal slides. But so how are we doing this? How are we dumping information you know, th from AD through SQL Server? Well, again, we mentioned this before. It's the OLEDB ADSI provider, and that's the main way that we're going to be looking for this information. We, can, we support two different ways to do that. The first one is open query through link servers, and the other one is through open row set using ad hoc queries. So that open query method there, again, we're using link servers. And essentially, you can use link servers um, to run queries on another instance of SQL Server or in another database. Um, and another big benefit of link servers is that you know you they can be used to allow data access from outside of SQL Server. And this is going to, you know, we can actually specify an OLEDB ADSI provider for that link server. So that's really the main way that we're gonna be able, able to dump this information. And then open query, essentially that's just executing a pass-through query on a link server. And that's how, that's the method you can do to run queries through a link server that you've set up. And again, you know, it's that provider is that OLEDB data source. So then on the other hand, we have the open row set method, and that's gonna be using ad hoc queries. And essentially, ad hoc queries are kind of just off the cuff, fly by night queries that are meant to be kind of run once and access data, and then that's it. And so you can kind of think of them as the opposite of stored procedures in that way. And they're disabled by default in SQL Server. So what Power Up SQL is going to be doing is it's going to be enabling it if it's disabled, and then once everything is run through, it goes back and restores the setting. So we're not trying to create massive state changes here when we're doing our testing. So again, if it's disabled, we enable it, then we disable it again. Um, and then open row set, again, like we mentioned before, that's kind of just your one-time connection to access remote data. Um, and it's a great alternative to link servers. You know, if you know that um, the SQL Server, you know, people are checking for link server creation, um, try using open row set. We've had a lot of luck with that. So these few slides here, I just want to show you what's going on under the hood in T-SQL, but we're not going to spend too much time on this, and I just want to highlight a few things here. So this is where we're creating our open query and our linked server here. So the one thing you want to pay attention to is that provider there, we're specifying the ADS DSO object, and we're also providing the data source there, which is the ADS you know, data source. And then here, with that link that we've just created, we're associating um, you know, the user's current security context with this link. And we're doing that by yourself, setting that to true, and then we're setting local login, remote user, and remote password all to null. And then you know, we pass that, uh, you know, our LDAP query through that link server, through, you know, and then it dumps that information through um, the ADSI and OLEDB provider. And then for open row set, same thing, except we're enabling um, you know, ad hoc queries, and then we're passing you know, the same stuff. We're providing that ADS DSO object as the provider and that data source, and we have our user, you know, our user filters there, and then you know, the LDAP query. So 
That is the last of it. Um, no more T-SQL, so don't worry about that. And this is just a list of functionality that PowerUp SQL currently supports. Um, and we're going to talk about you know, why we can't do some things and others, but really this is just your list of you know, stuff that you can dump from the domain through SQL Server. So let's get to some demos. So the first one here is we're just going to dump users from the domain. And what you need to do, the requirements for this is you need to specify an instance. And I would recommend also adding on that verbose flag. And in this example, we're looking only for users that are enabled. So should be running there. Runs pretty quickly. Um, in the next slide here, I'll show that output and we'll go over some of what it's doing there. Um, but you know, the first thing that it's checking for is that you have the current permissions for that instance or that SQL Server instance. So first of all, checks if you, you have sysadmin privs. If you don't, it's going to stop execution pretty much right away. Um, and then it creates, it, it checks to make sure that ADS DSO object is allowed to run in the current process. And again, if it can, it goes ahead and creates a randomly named link. And then once that link is associated with that user security context, runs that LDAP query, collects the results, and then kills that SQL Server link. So it's not leaving these links, you know, still on the server there. It's making sure, again, to avoid all kinds of state changes. And then this is just an example with open row set. Same thing here. We're providing that user state, making sure you know, we're looking for enabled users. And we're dumping dash use ad hoc. And that's going to be how you're going to be using ad hoc queries in open row set for this example. So there you go. Not too hard. And again, really, the only difference here from you know, the link server stuff is just making sure that ad hoc queries are enabled there. And if you know, they already are, it leaves it alone. And then you know, it resets those uh, configurations. So you know, we're not leaving massive state changes. And here's just another one, you know, dumping lapse passwords. We'll kind of touch back on this in a few slides here. But again, just works the same way. But you know, we can dump users, computers, lapse passwords, all kinds of information from the domain. So we mentioned before um, about sysadmin privileges. And Scott's done a ton of research into this and you know, what permissions you need to actually dump AD information from the domain. And really what we kind of settled on here is that we absolutely pretty much do need sysadmin privs for both open query and open row set. But if you're kind of interested in you know, the authorization table here, you know, I'll leave that in the slides, but oh, sorry. But yeah, those are the two tables here. And since we need to make sure that we have sysadmin privs for that database, you can also provide alternate credentials. And this is useful because you can provide, you know, for the actual, uh, you know, MS SQL instance, the user that has those SA uh, privileges, and then provide a different set of credentials to authenticate against LDAP with. So, you know, in this example, we have our sysadmin login, and we're using a completely different set of Windows domain credentials. So, you know, Supplying the username and password there, and obviously the link username and the link password are what you're using to authenticate against LDAP with. And that works pretty much the exact same way with ad hoc queries in open row set. So there are some caveats to using PowerUp SQL. Um, essentially, like we mentioned before, you need sysadmin privileges to return data. Multi-valued attributes can, it cannot be returned as well, which is extremely annoying, especially when you get an error like this. But description and member of are two examples of that. And you know, those can be, that's useful information that we've unfortunately haven't figured out how to dump yet. There should be workarounds through you know, SQL CLR stuff, but uh, you know, we're still looking into that. And then there's also paging. So essentially, if you don't know what paging is, that ensures that the result set is going to be pre presented in a number of individual pages that all contain the exact same number of results. So you know, for uh, I guess, I think Windows Server 2012, the default there is going to be 1,000. Um, so say for if you're dumping information, you have 1,001 results, you're only getting 1,000 back, which again, is unfortunate, but we're, you know, we're still working and looking at workarounds for that. So the second tool we're talking about here is GADI, or GoDDI. And that stands for Go Dump Domain Info. 
Um, and essentially, it's just a tool that's been written in Go to just do AD information gathering. So, you know, in contrast with Power Up SQL, it's a fully fledged SQL Server attack toolkit. But you know, this is kind of on a smaller scale, and really, it's just you know a tool that's been written in Go to dump this information. You know, and it so you know uh, supports cross-platform com uh, compatibility, which is really cool. So you know you you have your Linux binaries, you have your Windows binaries, and you know they all support that. Um, I mean, it's all wrapping the environment up in that binary when you drop it. So um, that's one caveat. So um, it also performs well in larger environments. You know, environments where I've run both Power Up SQL and Power View, you know, got your Go dump domain information is significantly faster just because we're using, you know, pure Go and LDAP. It's just a little bit more efficient in that way. And like I said before, for this, it's written in pure Go, but it does use another LDAP library that's written in Go, uh, you know, for all of the LDAP functionality. So to set it up, you can just use the binaries in the releases section, which is extremely simple. You know, drop it to disk, run it, or you can build it yourself. So if you want to do some, you know, make some custom queries or, you know, maybe tweak the paging a little bit, you can do that. So just make sure your Go environment is set up. Follow the link there on the screen. Um, and then just use the go get command to get that LDAP package, and you're on your way. So. What's going on under the hood? Again, we're just using LDAP pretty much, just simple LDAP queries. So we're again using a third party library there that's all written in Go. And we're doing our authentication and stuff through dial in binds. So we're using Golang's you know, standard TLS.client and we're managing our certificates through TLS.certificates. And you know, when, we're when the tool is looking for certificates, if we're doing LDAP over SSL, it's looking in the default you know, certificate store that's set you know, in, your, in, in your Go environment. So for Windows and Linux, it's obviously going to be different. But you know, the tool currently doesn't support you being able to specify a custom you know, certificate store on the command line. So just make sure to dump those certificates in the default store. So, you know, it supports SSL or LDAP over SSL on 636, start TLS, and plain text dials, which I wouldn't recommend doing plain text dials unless you're in a lab environment. So always make sure you're using LDAP over SSL because, you know, plain LDAP is going to be the default. Um, but at least for Gaudi, the tool here is going to, you know, default to using uh, LDAP over SSL on 636. So. And on Linux, again, you know, make sure you're providing those certs. And if you're on a Windows domain join mach machine, you shouldn't have a problem. So when creating the tool and you know making these LDAP queries, you know, we we try to take optimizations, you know, into the design here. And this is really just for any tool that you're using, you know, when you're creating LDAP queries, you may want to follow some of these steps here. So you know, we're going to be you know, querying for object category when possible. And we're using object category as an example here because it's one of many index attributes in AD. So that indexing basically allows us to make faster and more efficient queries um, against the DC. And we're also only querying for attributes that are needed. Again, the more attributes that you're adding, you know, that's going to be a longer search result, longer time, less efficient. So each one, we're making sure to only return what we need and what we want. And paging, like we mentioned before, you know, unfortunately, through Power Up SQL, the paging is, you know, doesn't quite work as well as we want it to. But here, you know, instead of just using that default of 1,000 results, we're setting the paging to 200 results. And the reason why we're doing this is it pr helps prevent client blocking on the Golang side, and it also reduces memory stress on the DC and avoids you know, heavy query detection and flagging, which is you know, something interesting we'll talk about right at the very end here. So this is kind of the last piece of code that we're going to be looking at, but this is just an example of you know, dumping lapse passwords, again, just through Go. So, you know, again, we're only specifying the attributes that we need up there. And, you know, that's DNS host name and both of those, you know, key lapse attributes. Um, and then our filter there, again, using ob object category because it's indexed. So, and then we make the actual LDAP search. But, so feature list. You know, users, computers, DCs, we're really dumping everything that, you know, everything that you want and everything that PowerView pretty much does. Um, and, you know, 
three of the things that here that I found pretty interesting are, you know, looking at LAPS passwords, GPP passwords, and sensitive data checks. So you, if you remember, you know, earlier in the talk, I kind of mentioned, you know, that one time where I found passwords in that description attribute. You know, we're just using a simple discovery, looking for keywords and stuff like that in that description attribute, and that'll get flagged and dumped in a separate CSV. So I'll just take a few slides to quickly go over some of the basics here of, you know, LAPS and GPP if you're not familiar. So, you know, LAPS, that's essentially the local administrator password solution created by Microsoft as, you know, intended for centralized storage of passwords in Active Directory. So all of your local administrator passwords on domain joined machines, all of those are going to be randomized, all of them are going to be unique. Um, so, you know, the, the access here can be limited through, you know, ACLs, but, you know, what we're looking for here is one, the admin password, and that's the attribute that stores the clear text password, but you need domain admin pl privileges to read that, which can be kind of a pain. Um, however, for the admin password expiration time, um, again, the attribute that stores the password reset date and time, all you really need is just to be an authenticated domain user and you can read that attribute. And that can be you know, extremely useful when you're looking for computers that have LAPS enabled that are using LAPS actively. And for GPP, this is just group policy preferences. And you know, group policy preferences essentially were you know, additional functionality that were added to group policy objects. And what you can do with those is you can change local administrator passwords, you can set configurations for printers, schedule tasks, all that kind of stuff. And when you provide a you know, set of credentials or a password through, you know, with GPP, that's going to create an XML file with an encrypted password, and that's going to be stored in that C password value. Um, AES 256-bit encrypted, and again, once you create a GPP, those XML files get dumped on sysfall in the policies folder, which, you know, this is all fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But for some reason, Microsoft did release that 32-byte AES private key. So if all authenticated users have access to sysvol, which means they all have access to these XML, these GPP files, they can get at that password. They can decrypt that password. So you know this was fixed in May of 2014, but you would be surprised how often we see GPP passwords floating around in environments. So again, like we mentioned before, this is a, you know, a list of example files here where you can find those encrypted C passwords stored. And just a quick demo here you know, with you know, both Windows and Linux with running the tool. So there are a number of required parameters. You, know, you need to provide the username, the password, the domain, your target DC, and then the option if you want to use start TLS or just the default um, TLS on 636. So pretty quick there. Um, we're, we'll go over the output there in a few seconds, but this is just the example for the, uh, the Linux command, and it runs just as fast. So again, going back to that Windows output, you know, we're looking for DCs, domain trusts, domain admins, all of that good stuff. And if you look there, we also found some warnings or some keywords with some possibly sensitive information that's been stored in that description attribute. Um, and we also found it looks like seven GPP passwords. So again, all of that output there is getting dumped to CSV and it creates a, you know, a CSV directory just to put all of those files that you can look at you know, at a later time and it's all saved off in that CSV folder. So you know, what are some caveats here with using you know, Gaudi or GoDDI? Well, you need to supply credentials every single time on the command line, which is kind of annoying and you know, that you can't have it when you're running on Windows run from the user's current security context, such as you know, when you use PowerUp SQL or PowerView. Um, and that's you know, kind of something that I'm interested in seeing if I can replicate that functionality with Go. Um, certificates can also be tricky. Um, when you're on a non-domain joined Windows machine, make sure to import those certificates on Linux and then on Windows. Um, and then when the get GPP functionality, we're using net use and mount to kind of map that share to sysfall, and that could really use some more robust error handling, and we could probably improve the XML parsing as well. That could be a little bit quicker. 
and probably one of the most annoying things that about you know the third party LDAP library that you know this tool is using is that all of the attributes need to be case sensitive which is extremely painful when you're trying to you know try and figure out and debug these functions like oh is that s supposed to be capitalized in sam account name and it's you know actually supposed to be lowercase so I don't know, maybe I should make a pull request for that, but. And in terms of the roadmap for Gaudi, um, you know, again, I would like to see if we could make it use that user's current Windows security context. So this would really be done through the use of com objects in Go. So tapping into those IEDS interfaces and seeing if we can, you know, first of all, create com objects in Go, which we know we can, but also creating those interfaces as well to dump all this information. So that would really require looking at lower level, you know, system calls through, you know, the syscall library in Go. So low DLL find procedure and then calling that procedure and then basically doing that over and over and creating you know custom structs to uh, save all this information and you know there is a library that does this in go already but it really doesn't support some of the functionality that I'm looking for um, and that would really fit this tool so so here, just kind of like the last bit of information here is just some very rudimentary detection. You know, Windows event IDs that I found that were kind of interesting while I was developing, while I was testing these tools here. So by no means is this an, an exhaustive approach, but you know, it might help you if you're looking for this type of behavior in your environment. So in your registry editor, go to this path here and take a look at the LDAP interface events and field engineering sections there. Go ahead and bump those up to five and those are going to create a, a huge, a ton amount of logs. So, you know, you probably don't wanna do this in a production environment. Take a look in your lab um, and see if it's beneficial for you. So, the two event IDs here, the first one, pretty simple, you already know that, and probably, you know, you don't need to turn those uh, settings up to five to see, you know, clear text binds or, you know, binds without signing, but 1644 basically has to do with costly LDAP searches. And this keys on either, you know, heavy query detection or, you know, LDAP queries that have not been optimized. Um, and then this is just two examples. Again, you know, this is what it's going to look like in that event log. But, you know, if you're using SASL or just like an LDAP bind, you know, that's going to get flagged there. And then for 1644, you can probably see that a little bit better. But this was actually created by my tool where I was looking for users with, you know, delegation, delegated users, in other words. So this event log is taking, you know, note of the filters that we're using specifically here, and also the search scope and the attribute selection, even down to like those individual attributes. So if you're seeing this sort of behavior in your environment where you know, a user is looking for you know, users with um, you know, delegated users or users that are part of a privileged user group, this may be something that could help you in identifying this sort of behavior. But So you know, wrapping up here, um, I'd just like to thank you know, everyone on that previous research slide who's helped me to learn about AD and you know, helping to write these tools. Um, and my colleagues, Scott Sutherland, Carl Foss, and Kevin Robertson, all really get great in helping me debug and learn all of this stuff, um, you know, and all the contributors, and really everybody at this talk. So you know, thanks, everybody, for uh, listening through and looking at some T-SQL with me. And if you want to talk security, you know, I should be at the con. Or if you want to talk the Venom movie, I'll be wandering around. So thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. <laughs>